Well, happy Wednesday to everyone. And thank you so much, Pastor Pedrin, for this opportunity. Um, looking forward to studying the Word of God with you this evening. Just going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. All right. Well, Pastor Petrin, can you confirm that you can see the screen? Yes, we can see the screen. All right. So this uh, study tonight is really just born out of a devotional that I had earlier uh, last week um, and, and some points that I felt touched on, and I would like to share it with you all this evening. Um, it's centered around the story of Zacchaeus, um, but it's really meant to be applicable and practical to our daily lives. So I don't think I need to press this point too much, but I, I'd say, I, at least I, I need restoration. And I would venture to say that many of us on the call need restoration as well. In fact, the Bible would agree with that assertion because in Revelation chapter 3, um, we know the story of the Laodicea church, which comprises of us uh, on this call today. The Bible calls out key indicators of spiritual health of church members in the last days, and it's quite descriptive. If you want to turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3, you can follow along from verse 14 through 17. And it really... Um, it really hits home, at least for me, as uh, the characteristics of, of the last day church. So Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 through 17, I'll, I'll read it. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things say the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy work. Neither cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So if you break down the different uh, qualities of the last day church, i.e. you and I, um, you'll you'll see here a few uh, what I'm calling indicators of spiritual health. The first one that Jesus calls out is a people that are not hot. The Greek word for hot is the word zestos. I guess that's where we get the word zest. And it means filled with passion, um, continued passion. So it's fair to say, at least in my life, I, I go through these dips. And I guess that's the definition of lukewarm, which I'll get to in just a moment. But as you examine your life, you know, you have to ask the question, are you filled with passion, the passion for Jesus? And it's my prayer that all of us would, you know, be hot Christians, right? Christians that are uh, filled with the passion of Jesus. Um, but Jesus also says that we're not cold either. <laughs> and so the Greek word there is sucros, which means a complete destitution of faith, and a lack of desire for holiness. So there seems to be this uh, thing within us, right, where we, we do have a desire to be in the fold of Jesus, to be close to Jesus, but our actions and really our hearts are not filled with an overwhelming presence, an overwhelming desire to be all out, or I guess all in for Jesus. So we're not hot, and the Bible also says that we're also not cold, and that puts us in a very precarious situation. It's it's a lukewarm uh, scenario where we end up fluctuating. The Greek word really points to a fluctuation, you know, between faithlessness but also fervor. You know, maybe you, towards the end of the week you get ramped up and you get ready for church and you have an emotional spiritual high. You know, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday comes and it starts to die down. Um, so, you know, that's just one example or one scenario. But our hearts kind of seem to be in this um, un unhealthy, neutral ground where we kind of want to be in the church, 
but we're still a little bit in the world. But the Bible also says, in addition to this, we have this perception that we're, we're falsely rich. You know, we, we just read that you say you're rich. And I don't think it's by coincidence that, you know, the first beatitude is blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, people who know that they're actually poor and need Jesus. Those are the people who will truly gain the riches. Um, but this this sense of false rich, rich riches, um, the feeling of spiritual wealth, this this kind of perception that yeah, I know the scriptures, I know the spirit of prophecy, I know the the principles and traditions of my faith, and thinking that that will get us by. It's this false sense of richness, which is very deadly. Um, Bible also says that we're wretched. Um, and, and the word wretched means enduring, enduring severe effort or afflicted um, as a result of having this misconception uh, of ourselves. We invite, you know, these um, additional, um, you know, I, I guess I should say ramifications of living uh, a double life start to add up. Right. And you kind of get the sense where we feel. Thing is missing and yet I can't really put my finger on it you know if you read uh, the book of Haggai and uh, really powerful you know it, God is saying you know you put money into your pockets only for it to go away right you eat this delicious food only for you to still be hungry you know there's this sense that you you do the right things and you go through the motions and yet you still feel spiritually empty um, it's it's truly a wretched place to be in and then there's the part of being miserable, right? And, and all this leads to misery and, you know, greatly to be pitied, right? There's nothing more pitiful than someone who thinks there's something when they're really not, you know? And, and I think, you know, that that's a type of deception that is, is really prevalent, you know, at least in my life at times where you kind of get the sense of, you know, you, you feel spiritual, you think you're spiritual, but are my actions really lining up? It's really a miserable place to be in. And then there's poor, right? So you're not really rich, you know, you're actually really poor. And, and this is really talking about poor and, and spiritual in your spiritual life, right? Destitute of Christian virtues and, and eternal riches. Um, you get the sense that the fullness of the Christian life that we should be living, we actually don't have. Um, and I'm not talking about, you know, this may not be you specifically, but generally speaking, this is the condition of the church, right? Um, blind, kind of an opaqueness, right? This, this fog that builds up where you can't really see clearly. And then nakedness. And, and that's really talking about righteousness without true righteousness. So the Bible is very clear, whether we feel it or not, <laughs> we need restoration, we need to be restored to the image of Christ. We need to be restored to the fullness of life, to the fullness of joy that Jesus has in store for us. And the question is, well, how, how does that happen? Um, Jesus, he's the one that can only do it. He's the one that longs to restore us. And in, in verse 18, he says, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich, white raiment that you may be clothed, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that you may see. And I kind of really see these as, as three main buckets, right? There's the spiritual fullness component where it's not just like head knowledge, right? It's it's kind of fullness of heart where you have the fullness of God's love and, and faith and joy in the heart. And you, you can truly experience um, godliness on a whole new level. Um, you, you're, you're one with God. You, you can hear him speak to you. You like the things that he likes and you detest the things that he detests. That's that's gold, right? You, you have this faith and, and love, faith tried in the fire and in this love that is just otherworldly, the self-sacrificial love, agape love. The white raiment is, is what I'm calling spiritual rightness, right? From a legal perspective, you are made right. You know, it's... The, the before the eyes of heaven and, and the great judgment, right? You you have been made right in Jesus. The, the old way of, of living you have denounced and that record of sin that is so stark and, and so 
um, bold against us gets wiped away, right? Your, Christ's righteousness, his spotless record gets superimposed on us. And, and we become, or we are, are then imparted to his righteousness, where we actually start living the life that he lived and he wants us to live. And then that I saw is being able to see, and I'm calling this spiritual vision. And so as, as these three things come together, this is kind of that holistic picture that God is wanting us to, to go towards. This is the, the type of restoration that he wants us to have in these last days. And the beautiful thing is he, he offers it without price. It's free. And it, it's us for the taking. It's ours for the taking if we just will indeed take it. You know, I, I think sometimes, especially as um, you may not be an Adventist, but at least as Christians, um the 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 deep things of the word right that require a lot of study unlocking uncoding um a lot of times it can go over our heads not because we're dumb but because it's not anchored right and and we it's, it's hard to anchor it in in reality it's hard to map it and align it to our lives and that's the good news is the Bible is filled with stories that elucidate these great doctrines of, of the Bible, these great truths. And, and that's where the stories come really greatly into play. You know, you read the prophecies of Daniel, and a lot of times they they're very, you know, it can be difficult to uncode or decode, I should say. Um, they become hard to align to our everyday life. But then when you see the first half of Daniel, the stories, and if you study the stories and the prophecies, they line up very well. The the image, right? When we talk about the image to the beast, you know, we can go back to the story of the image that Nebuchadnezzar um, put up and, and the response of the uh, three Hebrew men who decided not to bow down. You can kind of get in the mind, right, of, of kind of what it would be if, if an image was set up in in, in in this time, in this day and age, how would I then react? What would I do? So whenever you come across a, you know, a doctrine that seems to be a little complex or a topic in the Bible that isn't just landing, the, the way to get around it, or I guess that's to say a Bible hack, is to use a story of the Bible and make it a case study and see how you can align it that way. And, and what I decided to do was during this session, talk about Zacchaeus and show how the principles that we just read of the Laodicean church um, and the desire for restoration that all of us should have, how that was met in the life of Zacchaeus. And uh, I think it's a beautiful story. There's so many things to unlock and unpack, but I'm just going to go over a few lessons that I want to share with you this evening, um, how Zacchaeus was restored by Jesus. Um, just to play on the the, the um, restoration motif, the name Zacchaeus, if you look in the Greek, it actually means pure. <laughs> his name actually means pure, a purity. Um, so really, his story is a restoration to purity. You know, probably as a kid growing up in a Jewish household, you can imagine he's sitting beside his mom and dad and learning the Torah and, and, and learning the way of justice and righteousness. And, and somewhere along the way, he chose a profession that would deeply compromise those principles and lead him into a life of rebellion. But yet, the beautiful story about Zacchaeus is that he returns to that pure state by God's grace. And uh, that's a, a story and a journey that all of us can have and all of us can take. So I want to just share some reminders as, as fellow Laodiceans living in these days, um, what we can take in our path to restoration. And the first lesson that I want to share is that Jesus is passing through. And how will I respond? Jesus is passing through. How will I respond? The very first thing that we see in the story of Zacchaeus is that Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, verse 1. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background uh, from Desire of Ages, that this was not um, Zacchaeus' first, it was his first encounter with Jesus, but it, it wasn't his first encounter with this new spiritual kingdom that was being preached. Mm -hmm. 
In fact, um, John, he heard the preaching of John the Baptist. You know, he heard the preaching that if you had stolen anything, you know, return it to that person. And in that message, the Holy Spirit led John the Baptist, uh, led Zacchaeus to John the Baptist and helped him and pricked his heart and, and kind of prepared the way for this, this impressive moment that he's going to have with Jesus. Um, at that moment, God is passing through, and, and, and Zacchaeus takes the opportunity and sits and listens to John the Baptist. And that then opens up a new, another opportunity for the Holy Spirit to work on Zacchaeus some more. It really drills into this story. Um, and, and here it says the instructions to the publicans exact no more more than that which has appointed you. That's what John the Baptist had preached. Um, and, and she says that it impressed his mind. He knew the scriptures, you know, from an early age. He, he knew what it said. And the Holy Spirit was able to unlock that in his mind. And he was convicted that it was wrong. He felt that he was a sinner. And yet when he heard Jesus, it kindled hope in his heart. So the point that I want to bring up here is that in, in God and his desire to restore us, he draws us and enters our environment with opportunities for us to respond to him. So it's really important to remember that uh, it's not you coming to, to God necessarily first, right? It, it's God coming to us, impressing us and drawing us. And in those moments that he's drawing us, he's wanting us to respond each time. And as we respond, it provides new opportunities for us to buy from him and experience him. You know, when Jesus says, buy from me gold and, you know, that's tried in the fire and that's pure in Revelation, we see what that really means in the story of Zacchaeus is that whatever God brought before him and put in his path, he took that opportunity and he went all out to pursue it. He, he was buying those experiences with God. He was buying the uh, faith and the love that God was generating in his heart. John 6, says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Jesus is passing through in your life. How will you respond? The next reminder that I want to bring this evening is that we really must know ourselves. And the question that I have for us today and, and for you is, who are you really? Um, in verse 2, it, it gives us a glimpse into who Zacchaeus is. It says, now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Um, Desire of Ages says uh, he was a chief among the publicans. He was a Jew detested by his countrymen. His rank and wealth were the reward of a calling they abhorred, and which was regarded as another name for injustice and extortion. The Cambridge Bible says he was employed to regulate the balsam duties and the exports and imports between the domains of the Romans and Antipas were the chief classes at Jericho. So really, uh, he had a name for himself. He had a top position at his workplace, even in his community. He was also in a political position as well. So this is really a glimpse of who Zacchaeus was and what he got himself into. And, and the point that I want to bring this evening is that we need to know who we really are so we can bring our flawed characters to Jesus for transformation. Um, there's a couple verses that I want to share and then a quote from Ellen White that I think really hits home here. You know, the Bible says, let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. So one of the observations that I find in my life and in, in what I see, um, you know, in my experience, I guess it's been what, 20, almost 20 years as an Adventist, is that um, it, it's hard for us to really dig deep and to do self-examination. It's, it's, we don't want to do it. It's tough work. You know, it's, it's really hard to think about who we are, our characters, our dispositions, um, what we're prone to, uh, what our past faults have been. For Zacchaeus, it was probably very pain, a painstaking exercise, you know, literally. He's probably going over records of all of the money he's collected, and he probably is doing math to see what was the actual amount that was supposed to be collected. 
versus the amount that was collected. Um, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but there's a painstaking exercise that must take place if we are to be restored. And that is cooperating with Jesus to let him reveal to us who we really are. Uh, Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. The brain is a very complex mechanism. Uh, our, our personalities are very complex as well. The way we think, uh, our dis, uh, um, dispositions, our characteristics, uh, uh, our personalities. Who are you? And, and, and are we bringing that to God? Do you know the strengths of who you are? Do you know the weaknesses of who you are? Do you know what you're prone to? Ellen White says a very interesting uh, statement and very clear. She says, but we must make, have a knowledge of ourselves, a knowledge that will result in contrition before we can find pardon and peace. We must feel the pain of our wounds or we should not desire healing. So there is a, a self-introspection that Ellen White's advocating for, you know, and the whole point of it is not to wallow in sorrow um, and not to be discouraged by the brokenness that is us, but so that we can feel the pain of separation that we really have, the, the, the feel the, um, the pain of the mistakes that we've made, um, and, and bring that to Jesus so that we don't have a surface level faith, but that we have a deep faith um, so that we can actually see the transformation right before our eyes so that we can see that we need to be saved. So, you know, you kind of think about the profile of Zacchaeus, right? He's analytical, he's political, he's emotionally callous and or weak. He had to be to, to be able to stare people in the face, people who were struggling financially and still extracting the money that he extracted from them. You know, that, that has to be a, 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 you know, some of us are kind of prone to, to not be as emotionally connected to other folks. Um, it's just a, a disposition. Uh, but for him, that's taking it to the next level for sure. He's hierarchical in his, his mindset. He's uh, obviously short physically. He's, he's rich and he's a leader, right? So all of these have a part to play in how he sees God uh, from an untransformed perspective and how he sees his fellow uh, man. And, you know, what I want to encourage you to tonight is to think about what your profile is. You know, what, what is your personality profile? Um, I'm a big fan of leveraging the research that is done by experts in, in, in you know, various fields, whether it's psychology or sociology or science or whatever it may be, um, not because they're perfect models or frameworks, but because um, it's an attempt to help to um, categorize and aggregate a whole bunch of data points that we have as, as people, uh, as, as persons, right? And, and be able to see ourselves in new light. And so, you know, these tests or, or these um, evaluations or assessments really help to see things like, you know, what, what am I, what am, am I extroverted or introverted? And what's that implication when it comes to, you know, going to church or, or, um, talking with uh, folks in, in group settings, right? Am I a big picture person or am, do I get into the details, right? Am I very regimented or do I like to um, kind of take time and pause and reflect? So that all has implications, all has strengths and weaknesses and, and none of them is, is, a, is a perfect model, but you, know, you, you start to see, this is kind of, man, wow, this is how I trend as a human being and I need to be careful in this spot because maybe I, you know, don't take the time to listen uh, to God because I always want to be around people or, oh, maybe I, I'm kind of by myself too much. Maybe I need to be around people more. Um, there's, there's a whole disposition uh, profile, right? You know, being a sanguine or phlegmatic and or melancholic, right? All of that, you know, maybe we have a more tendency to not be optimistic in life, or maybe we're too optimistic uh, when it comes to people and relationships, and that's kind of hurting us. So, you know, looking at your disposition really helps to see what areas you need to work on uh, and what areas you're not well-rounded in. 
Um, there's a whole theory called attachment theory, you know, things that we go through as children um, and, and the ways that our parents, you know, have or have not raised us to the, the standard that should have been um, all has impacts on how we interact with our loved ones, our spouses or our significant others. And uh, sometimes it's, it's not perfect and we should be aware of that so that we don't inflict any harm in our relationships. Love languages, right? You know, uh, a lot of times this is seen in, in terms of marriage relationships, but it can also be seen in the sense of your relationship with God. Um, if, if you're very much a, a gifts oriented person, that's a great gift to, to have. You may see God primarily, though, as a, as a gift giver or you giving gifts to him rather than maybe leaning too much towards that rather than doing some acts of service um, as to, to round yourself out. Right. And then, of course, limitations. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was short and that was an absolute limitation for him to see Jesus. But he didn't let him, he knew that was his limitation. And he didn't let him, let that stop him. And, you know, we as fragile human beings all have limitations. And so we need to know what those limitations are so that we would be able to um, overcome them. You know, for me, I, I suffer from anxiety and, um, you know, I hate it, but it, it's just a reality that I'm working through. I, you know, I go to therapy, it helps a lot. And, um, you know, taking herbs and all of that. But, you know, sometimes I'm having devotion. I just can't focus. So what do I do? Do I stop having devotion with God? No. You know, maybe I find a different time where I, you know, I'm able to be a little bit more alert. Or, you know, what I also do is I tend to do a little bit more of an analytical study from Scripture and then get some, you know, great knowledge and then uh, evoke my heart to, to pray um, and to reflect on what I just studied. And that usually helps a lot. So the bottom line is, you know, we all have limitations. What do you do about them and, and how do, will you work with Jesus to overcome them? Reminder three, as we start to wrap up, we must make things right. Uh, this is really important. So Zacchaeus didn't just, you know, say, okay, I had a lot of mistakes. I messed up. I'm coming to Jesus and everything's going to be okay. And, you know, that's very tempting to do. It, it really is. It's very tempting to just you know, wash every, everything in the past and say, you know what, that's not me anymore. Let's move forward. Um, don't hold that against me, so-and-so. Um, just get over it. Uh, there, there's so many things that we can um, do to mask the, the, the pain that we've inflicted on other people. But that's not what Zacchaeus did. He said, Lord, I, I give half of my goods to the poor. If I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Um, Zacchaeus, he, he, he knew um, that it wasn't enough just to ask forgiveness from God. He had to make things right with this fellow man. And, and the point that I want to make here is, you know, we can never have gold or white raiment unless we take inventory of who we've wronged and we make things right. And, um, you know, that's not just me saying it. Uh, Ellen White says it very clearly. No repentance is genuine. That does not work reformation. The righteousness of Christ is not a cloak to cover unconfessed and unforsaken sin. It's a principle of life that transforms the character and controls the conduct. Holiness is wholeness to God. It is the entire surrender of heart and life to the indwelling of the principles of heaven. So, you know, we're not just to say we get a blanket forgiveness from God and everything is okay. Um, you know, he does forgive us like that, but... He also calls us to make things right. I, you know, there's relationships that we have broken through selfishness and through um, self-seeking, through, um, you know, being overly reactive emotionally, getting angry unnecessarily, um, blaming, pointing fingers. Um, and, and, and that has caused a lot of pain and, um, you know, whether it's in church context or whether it's in our family or even uh, work environments, you know, j just because you may have not stolen anything monetarily doesn't mean you haven't stolen someone's time or energy or feelings. And uh, Jesus is asking us to think through, is there anyone that you've wronged that you must make right? Uh that's a biblical principle, right? 
And, and God is asking us to do that. Now, these are all hard things to do, right? Uh, taking self-inventory, self-examination, but and also making things right with people that we've wronged. But if we really want to be restored, we must do it and we must not delay. So as I, as I end, the last reminder is Jesus died for you and wants to be an abiding resident in your heart. Will you invite him today? Jesus said to Zacchaeus, I must stay at your house today. Come down. I must stay at your house today. You know, Jesus honors the cooperation that we bring uh, when he uh, comes to us. He, he, he honors the faith and the love that we show. He honors the uh, respect that we give him. And he honors as we embrace him wholeheartedly. And as he sees those things, he desires to be a longing guest or he desires to be an abiding resident in our hearts. Now, we don't do these things to be saved, but we do these things because we're being saved. And we know that we're being saved if we are seeing these things transpire in us. Um, my, my simple appeal to you is, uh, do you need to be restored this evening? Well, here are some practical reminders uh, in your journey to restoration. And may we all be restored and be ready for the soon second coming of Jesus. Thank you and God bless you. Alex, you can lead us in the closing prayer, please. Sure. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus this evening. So grateful that you come to us and you're the one that pricks our hearts and speaks to us. You're the one that embraces us and hugs us and tells us you love us. And as you do that, you walk with us as we have so many um, questions and we have so many thoughts and so many things that we want to do. You lead us and guide us through it all. You will make us ready for your soon second coming. You're saving us, each one and every one of us, and we're grateful for it. Please help us to do the difficult things, Lord. Please help us to put the time and energy to, to love you and to love our brothers and sisters. And may we keep our eyes focused on you always. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.